After looking at accuracy and reliability, the final component that we need to consider in science experiments is validity. Validity refers to how well an experimental procedure tests the aim and hypothesis of the experiment. In other words, does our method actually find what we set out to find? A valid experiment is one with proper treatment of the independent, dependent and controlled variables. If you remember from Year 10 Science, the independent variable is what we change in our experiment, the dependent variable is what we measure, and the controlled variables are what we keep the same across all trials. Remember, the aim of a science experiment is to see how changing the independent variable affects the dependent variable. If our experiment is valid, then we can draw meaningful conclusions about the effect of changing the independent variable on the dependent variable. If our experiment is invalid, then we cannot make a formal conclusion because other variables may have affected the results. Let's return to our archery competition from the previous videos where the contest is drawing to a close. The aim of this competition is to measure each archer's skill with a longbow and identify the best archer. Therefore, the independent variable is the archer, which is a different person in every round. The dependent variable is each archer's score after they fire three shots. All other variables should be kept controlled to ensure that the competition is fair. Our last competitor is Chelsea the Cheetah. In case her name didn't give it away, Chelsea the Cheetah doesn't always play fair. Let's see how she goes. All three of her arrows hit the bullseye. It looks like she's actually a pretty good shot. Maybe she's as accurate and reliable as Robin Hood. Wait, what's this? Chelsea the Cheetah was using a crossbow? That's not fair at all. The rule book clearly states that only long bows are allowed. By using a crossbow, Chelsea has introduced a new type of bow into the competition. This breaks the rules, as the type of bow is meant to be the same for each archer. We could conclude that she's pretty good with a crossbow, but we have no idea how well she can fire a longbow. And let's be honest, aiming a crossbow is much easier. Therefore, we cannot conclude who is the best at aiming with a longbow because Chelsea didn't perform the exact same test. To avoid similar issues in our science experiments, we need to pay close attention to the independent, dependent and controlled variables. This will allow us to draw valid conclusions from our data. Let's go through each of these variables in more detail and see how they relate to validity. Let's start by looking at the independent variable. The independent variable is the factor which we manipulate or change in an experiment. An experiment tests how the independent variable affects the dependent variable. For an experiment to be valid, we should only change one factor at a time. That way, we can conclude that any differences in our results are solely due to the changes in the independent variable and not other factors. Remember, the aim of the archery competition is to find who is the best at shooting arrows with a longbow. The independent variable is the archer, whether it be Robin Hood, Too Tall Trevor or someone else. In each round, we test a different archer. But when it was Chelsea the Cheetah's turn, she introduced another changing variable, the type of bow. This means that two factors were changed, the archer and the type of bow. We cannot attribute her good score to just her archery skill, as using the crossbow may have contributed in some way. Therefore, the results from her round are invalid. Let's see how this applies to chemistry. Suppose we perform an experiment to determine how changing the concentration of hydrochloric acid affects the rate of its reaction with zinc. Hydrochloric acid reacts with the metal zinc to produce zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. Firstly, we pour 50 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid into a conical flask, which has a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Then, 
we add a 4 cm length of zinc ribbon. The reaction produces hydrogen gas, which displaces water in the measuring cylinder. We let the reaction proceed for 10 seconds and record the volume of hydrogen gas produced. Then we repeat the experiment using 2 molar hydrochloric acid at 10 degrees Celsius. We find that the volume of gas produced is the same. In this experiment, we are changing the concentration of hydrochloric acid, which is the independent variable. Our dependent variable is the volume of hydrogen gas produced in 10 seconds, which is used to measure the reaction rate. When we interpret the results, we could say that increasing the concentration of hydrochloric acid did not affect the reaction rate. But since we have another changing variable, we could also say that decreasing the temperature did not affect the reaction rate. This doesn't sound right. So what happened? Since we actually have two independent variables, the concentration of hydrochloric acid and temperature, we cannot determine how changing each one affects the results. Hence, we cannot make a valid conclusion. In fact, it is likely that the reaction rate increased as we increased the concentration of hydrochloric acid. However, this would have been cancelled out by the lower temperature, which decreases reaction rate. The correct conclusion to this experiment is that the combined increase in concentration of hydrochloric acid and decrease in temperature did not affect the overall reaction rate. This conclusion does not address the aim of our experiment. Our aim focuses on hydrochloric acid concentration, but our conclusion mentions something unrelated, temperature. This is why we can only have one independent variable in an experiment. We want to make sure that any change in the results can be solely attributed to changes in a single variable. Now, let's look at the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the factor that we measure in an experiment. Remember, an experiment tests how the independent variable affects the dependent variable. Usually, there is only one dependent variable in an experiment, but sometimes it is helpful to have two or more dependent variables. For an experiment to be valid, we need to make sure that we are actually measuring the dependent variable and not some other factor. Sometimes there are many different factors that we can measure to achieve our experimental aim, so we need to pick the most appropriate one for each experiment. Let's apply this to the archery competition. We are trying to find who is the best archer, and one way we can measure this is by having each archer fire three arrows at a target and finding their total score. A bullseye could be worth 10 points, and the outer rings would be worth less. However, there are other ways to identify the best archer. We could also replace each target with a boy balancing an apple on his head. Each archer would fire three arrows, and for each apple they hit, they would get 10 points. In this scenario, it is much harder to score points, but we are still testing the skill of each archer because they must land their arrows in a small area. So this would be a valid test, even if it doesn't pass the safety assessment. But what if we try measuring the speed of each person's arrows using a radar gun? The speed of an arrow has nothing to do with an archer's aim, so it isn't a good indication of each archer's shooting skills. The results of such an experiment would be invalid because we've measured something that does not address the aim of the experiment. Let's return to our experiment involving the reaction between zinc and hydrochloric acid. Remember, the aim was to determine how changing the concentration of hydrochloric acid affects the rate of its reaction with zinc. To achieve this, we measured the volume of hydrogen gas produced in 10 seconds. This is valid because a faster reaction will produce more gas in the same 10-second interval. However, there are other ways to measure the rate of this reaction. For example, we could perform the reaction in a sealed container with a pressure sensor. As the reaction proceeds, hydrogen gas is released and the pressure increases. 
so we could measure the initial pressure inside the container and the pressure after 10 seconds. This is also valid because a faster reaction will produce more hydrogen gas and cause a greater pressure after 10 seconds. Therefore, we can change the experimental method to use a different dependent variable and still obtain meaningful results. Another student, Carl, suggests that we measure both the total volume of hydrogen gas produced and the time taken for the reaction to reach completion. But Carl has forgotten an important detail. Even though we changed the concentration of hydrochloric acid in each trial, the acid is always in excess. This means that zinc is the limiting reagent, so the reaction stops when we run out of zinc. Since each trial involves the same amount of zinc, the reaction will always produce the same amount of hydrogen gas. Therefore, the total volume of hydrogen gas produced is not a good indicator of reaction rate and is not a valid dependent variable. Let's look at Carl's other dependent variable, the time taken for the reaction to reach completion. The reaction produces hydrogen gas, so we know that the reaction stops when no more bubbles are produced. Furthermore, since zinc is the limiting reagent, all of the zinc will be consumed at completion. He could measure how long this takes using a stopwatch. Now, if the reaction rate increases, the reaction should reach completion faster and the time taken will be smaller. Therefore, this is a valid measure of reaction rate. Therefore, we should carefully select the variables that we measure in an experiment so that we obtain valid results. Let's move on and discuss controlled variables. A controlled variable is a factor that is kept constant in an experiment. Remember, for an experiment to be valid, we should only change one factor at a time. When we change the independent variable to see its effect on the dependent variable, we should keep all the other factors that could influence the dependent variable constant. If some other factor is allowed to change, even by a little bit, then the results cannot be solely explained by the independent variable, and the validity of the experiment is reduced. Therefore, in most experiments, there are many controlled variables. The number varies depending on the experiment being performed, but in general, you should try to identify as many controlled variables as possible when designing an experiment. For example, the archery competition runs according to a set of rules. These rules ensure that everything is kept constant between rounds, except for the archer, of course. Let's read through them. The first rule specifies that all bullseyes are the same size and shape. If we increased the size of the bullseye for one archer, then it would require less skill to aim at. On the other hand, if we changed the shape of the bullseye from a circle to a rhombus for one archer, it would require more skill to hit. So we need to keep the shape and size of the bullseye constant between archers, otherwise we can't draw meaningful conclusions about each archer's ability to aim. The second rule states that only longbows are allowed. As we saw with Chelsea the cheetah, it requires less skill to aim with a crossbow than a longbow. Therefore, each archer needs to use the same type of bow, or we can't make fair judgments about each archer's ability to hit the bullseye. The third rule says that competitions are not held on windy or rainy days. Rain causes arrows to slip off bowstrings and obscure competitors' vision, while wind blows arrows off course. This makes it more difficult for everyone to shoot. Hence, it is important to limit archery contests to specific environmental conditions. The fourth rule asserts that each archer must stand 20 metres from the target. Standing closer to the target will make it easier for them to aim and hit the bullseye. Therefore, we can only reach fair conclusions if all archers stand at the 20-metre line. Wait a minute. These rules sound like a list of controlled variables. All of these rules must be followed so that we can reach meaningful conclusions about each archer's shooting skill. Similarly, 
Chemistry experiments must have controlled variables so that we can draw meaningful conclusions about how our independent variable affects our dependent variable. Firstly, we need to use the same measuring instruments each time. This is just like the archery competition, where each person needs to use the same type of bow and shoot at the same type of target. In our experiment, we should use the same stopwatch and measuring cylinder because different instruments might be calibrated differently or have different scales. In other words, we could measure the same thing using two different instruments and get different measurements because their increments are different. Next, we need to keep the environmental conditions the same. As we saw in the archery competition, Factors like the wind and rain make it difficult to shoot arrows. Similarly, in chemistry experiments, we need to keep factors like ambient or surrounding temperature, air pressure, wind speed and light intensity constant, as they may influence results. For example, we know that increasing temperature increases reaction rate. So if we are testing how the concentration of hydrochloric acid affects the rate of its reaction with zinc, then we need to keep the temperature of both reagents constant. Often, we need to control variables that are specific to our experiment, like how the archers are required to stand 20 metres from the target. In our experiment, we kept the volume of hydrochloric acid and the dimensions of the zinc strip constant. If we increased the volume of hydrochloric acid, then the volume of hydrogen gas produced in 10 seconds might have increased. Similarly, if we increased the size or changed the shape of the zinc strip, the reaction rate might have increased. So to achieve valid results for the rate of reaction, we needed to keep both of these variables constant. Do you study any other science subjects, such as biology or physics? If so, the core ideas of independent, dependent and controlled variables are the same across all science subjects. The only differences between the subjects are the experiments you perform, so we will look at different examples in each video. If you study biology, make sure to watch our second lesson on validity for biology, as we will introduce confounding variables. These are variables that are not controlled and may affect the independent and dependent variables, possibly leading to an incorrect conclusion. In chemistry and physics, you don't need to learn about confounding variables, so we haven't included them in this lesson. Let's revise what we've learned in this lesson. Validity refers to how well an experimental procedure tests the aim and hypothesis of the experiment. A valid experiment is one with a proper treatment of the independent, dependent and controlled variables. The independent variable is the factor which we manipulate or change in an experiment. The dependent variable is the factor that we measure in an experiment. A controlled variable is a factor that is kept constant in an experiment. The aim of a science experiment is to see how changing the independent variable affects the dependent variable. An experiment should only have one independent variable and one or more dependent variables. All other variables should be kept constant so that we are certain that the independent variable is the only factor that causes the observed change in the dependent variable. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on chemistry, check out our second video on validity.